So I was thrilling to launch a new book, and I'm very happy to be back here at USC to talk about my latest book, which is, as you see now, called Will Africa Feed China? And uh, this book comes as China's own uh, consumption of food, both in China and, uh, and food from around the world, has been growing. And uh, the idea of what China wants as China rises, how China's going to fulfill its wants, and what this means for the United States, for Africa, for the rest of the world, I think is very much on our minds these days. And so what China wants in terms of food um, is an area that we're concerned about, and in Africa they've been concerned about this as well. So, but I think that the gap between the conventional wisdom on how China, the Chinese, Chinese government, is viewing Africa and what's actually going on there is very large. It's really, I think right now, the biggest area in which that gap between the myth and the reality uh, is, is very, very large indeed. So in Europe and in the United States, parts of Africa and other parts of the world, we have generally seen China's presence in Africa as being threatening, a new colonialism. And I think this uh, area of uh, land grabbing or Chinese wanting to acquire areas of land in Africa in order to feed the Chinese people is one of these areas. It fits into the general narrative and, and our set of beliefs about what the Chinese are doing. And you can see some of the, the material there. And I think about uh, 2008, there was um, a rise in global food prices. And in 2008, people started to think that a book that had been published 20 years ago uh, by Lester Brown, who's an ecologist who lives in Washington, and the title of that book was called, does anyone know? Stan, you know, Who Will Feed China? <laughs> Who Will Feed China? So Lester Brown wrote this book in 1995, and it caused quite a stir in China because they started to think, hmm, as our middle class expands and as we need more imported food from around the world, uh, this could be politically destabilizing. It could be difficult for other parts of the world because that Chinese demand could make prices rise. And Lester Brown said, basically, this is going to be a disaster. And so uh, my book is, is called, Will Africa Feed China? Which is a play on that earlier book there. And of course, it does look as though China will need to go outward for its food. We know that China has about 9% of the world's arable land and 20, 21, 22% of the world's population. Um, and so as the middle class increases, they are going to need more food. And Africa, on the other hand, has very large expanses of land. And not nearly as many people. And so it looks as though there's a a kind of a match there. And so a conventional wisdom has built up around this. And I'm going to read a, a few th quotes from the media. Um, and I am here being sponsored by the, your communications program and your China program and so on. Here at the, the great school uh, with a, one of the world's best, or the world's best communications and media programs. I hope none of your journalists have been responsible for the quotes I'm going to read you here. <laughs> so. Um, in August 2012, the chief economist of the African Development Bank published an article and he said, China is the biggest land grabber in the world and in Africa. Um, and so the idea is that the Chinese have actually acquired large amounts of land. So let me give you a few other here. China has extensive holdings in Africa, including pending or attempted deals for millions of hectares in the Democratic Republic of Congo, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Uganda, and Tanzania with many thousands of Chinese workers brought in to work on these lands. On an Israeli news website we read, Chinese farms control most of Zambia's agriculture. CBS News published an article, quote, China recently purchased half the farmland under cultivation in the Congo. And the second part of this conventional wisdom is that the strategy has been devised by government officials in Beijing. So as uh, the Daily Mail, which is uh, that reputable newspaper in Britain, wrote, <laughs> the strategy has been carefully devised by officials in Beijing. And at a Washington DC based think tank, we read China has invested immense sums in African agriculture. So, so the third idea that we <coughs> hear about is that they want to grow food to send back to feed the Chinese people. And so the Rockefeller Foundation wrote, the growing desire, the growing Chinese desire for African produced food could mean that poor people in African countries may no longer have the resources they need to survive. Um, and then finally, uh, we hear that the Chinese 
are sending Chinese farmers to grow this food. And so a French television station said the Chinese conquest of African farmland will provide a solution for, four, for the millions of Chinese peasants deprived of their land. And even crime novelists are getting in on it. Um, Henning Mankell, who's written the Kurt Volander series, wrote, uh, he told a, a French journalist, and they printed it in the French paper, I read just the other day that China has rented land in Kenya to move some one million peasants to Africa. So these are just some of the stories that are out there uh, in the media and circulating around that have created this conventional wisdom. So in this book, I explain why not a single one of those stories is actually true based on, on the evidence that I've been able to accumulate. So how did I do this? Well, I actually have, as we heard from Clayton, <coughs> I've got a background in this issue that goes back a ways. Now, I don't know if you can tell which one I am in this picture. <laughs> <laughs> Just to help you out there. So Carol and I have known each other for a while, but even you haven't known me that long. <laughs> so this is from my PhD field work in West Africa. And as you can see, I'm, I'm there <laughs> interviewing Chinese and, and Africans who are working on an agricultural project. This, uh, by the way, today has become a commercial farm that's owned by a Chinese company. In those days, it was a Chinese aid project. So this is another picture here. So now what we did for this project is we collected the 60 largest cases that we could find in the media or in think tank reports or the Rockefeller Foundation or any researchers' reports. We collected the 60 largest cases of purported Chinese land grabs in Africa, and we investigated every one of them. And so uh, this is one uh, example here. This is an article from the Hindustan Times, and they also believe that the Chinese are way ahead of them in terms of this. And there are two cases here. One says in 2007, China bought 2.8 million hectares in the Congo. The other one says they spent 800 million in Mozambique to expand rice production. So that's how we would collect our, our data. And then we did uh, what I call forensic internet sleuthing. And this is a way of, of digging first uh, to see what you can find in the internet about that particular case. And I don't know how many of you have done this kind of thing, just to try to dig and dig and find out what you can find. So some of you are nodding. I've given it this term, but I really think it's like CSI Miami, but we do it in Washington. And you know, you're digging into a case and you're cutting and slicing and dicing it and so on. I like to have somebody do a, a, a little movie on us doing this research sometimes, because people come up with this like, Eureka! For one example, we had a case that uh, turned up that the Chinese had supposedly invested $2 billion in Nigeria to grow rice. So we thought, this looks really interesting. <laughs> Quickly start Googling it. So right away we find out it's not $2 billion, it's 2 billion naira. So that's, a, that's about $17 million. So that was the first part. Then the, the next thing, a few more minutes of Googling, we find the name of the company. And it says Ofada VT. And I thought, Ofada VT. This just doesn't sound like a Chinese company. So VT, is I start, Ofada, it turns out, is Yoruba for rice. So that's, and then VT, they turn out to be a famous Indian basmati rice company. And so Ofada VT turns out to be an Indian basmati rice company that's importing three rice mills into Nigeria to do rice processing because Nigeria has uh, import substitution policies now for local rice growing. So that was a, the $2 billion Chinese rice investment that poof, just disappeared. So we did a lot of that kind of studies. Um, we also did field work. So 12 countries in Africa, a lot of research in China because we wanted to talk to the companies that were doing this uh, investing and the Chinese government, the Ministry of Agriculture. And uh, on one of my visits to Beijing to the Ministry of Agriculture, I was sitting with a, the person who's in charge of their international cooperation division. And he said to me, you know, he said, doing research on this kind of thing is really hard, even for us. And, and I had to agree with him. It was really hard. Um, this is an example of us going into the field in Mozambique. Um, but this was, I was actually following this truck here. This is in Zimbabwe and again going into the field. But there were times when I was on that, <laughs> that bus uh, doing this kind of work. So it was challenging. We also looked at all of the Chinese uh, policy framework, everything that was, in, uh, that was put out by Beijing, everything the Ministry of Commerce put out, the Ministry of Agriculture. We looked at where the money was flowing to try to uh, see if there was an incentive structure that would suggest that Chinese want to grow food in Africa. 
And this is uh, 21 of the largest cases we found. I'm not going to go through all of these here, but what I'm going to do is make them disappear really quickly. Because the first group of cases that we found are old aid projects that have been around for, for 40 years in some cases. And now they've been turned into commercial farms, and the Chinese have started to lease those. So that's not really land grabbing. They aren't even all that huge. So they disappear here. And then we have a group that uh, turned out to be commercial investments that the Chi Chinese companies came in in the 1990s. And they leased companies under privatization programs. So a few more disappear here. And then we have ones that turn out to be actually construction contracts, where an African government or the Libyan government or the Malian government hired a Chinese company to build a big state farm for them or, or an infrastructure of some kind. So some of these disappear in that case. Yeah, those are all there. Then we have ones in which there was a Chinese company that was interested in doing some kind of investment. But they went to Africa. The feasibility didn't work out for one reason or another. So those all disappeared there. <coughs> and then we get one that looks like it might happen still, but then Ebola hit. That one went away. And this is what we've got. Four projects. So out of all those 21 there, it comes down to these. And so all of these projects exist. Uh, this is the only one that's actually that big right now, but these are all ones in which they've acquired um, the permission to have this much land, and the investments are definitely there and going ahead. So, now I want to tell you three stories about what the Chinese are or aren't doing. All of these involve Chinese companies that got a lot of media attention for doing a big project. And uh, the point that I want to make in these stories is that these are companies that are going to Africa to make a business investment like other companies. Now, this actually isn't a, the farm. I just put this up here because it's Mozambique. But the story I want to tell you starts with a Mozambican. And his name is Zaidi Ali. He's a Muslim. His family came from India several generations ago. And in 2004, he decided he wanted to go into farming. And he wanted to grow soybeans. But he didn't know the first thing about it. And so he went to Brazil <coughs> because they speak Portuguese, they grow soybeans. And while he was in Brazil learning about soybeans, trying to get some assistance to come over and help him, he met a Chinese company. It was a, a China Grain and Oils Corporation. And they were also in Brazil to buy soybeans. And so they exchanged business cards, which is what you do with Chinese companies that you meet. They went back to Beijing. He went back to Mozambique. But he kept thinking about them, and he thought, maybe I could get them to come to Mozambique and partner with me. So in 2004, he went to Beijing. He met up with them. He told them that he had this land. He had 24,000 hectares that he had leased. Would they come? So they sent a delegation. They looked at the land. And they decided to do a joint venture. So 2005, they went ahead. They did the joint venture. And the rain stopped. There was no irrigation. There was no rain. And then some kind of bug came in and, and started attacking the roots of the soybean plants. And there was no uh, infrastructure. There was no um, scientists. There was no extension service. They didn't know. Nobody knew about soybeans there. The whole crop was lost. The very next year, China Grain and Oils Corporation was acquired by Kofco, which is China's big commodity trader. And so Kofco looked at this failing project in Mozambique, and they went, let's get rid of that one. Project went bankrupt. I met Zaidi Ali in Maputo. Just to, to give you another example of my research skills, I actually tracked him down on LinkedIn. <laughs> <laughs> Friend, will you, will you link up with me, Zaidi Ali? And he agreed to meet me in Maputo. Um, and he told me about this. And so we had this lunch. He told me his whole story. It's all in the book. And as we were walking out, he said, you know, he said, I lost a lot of money on that project. And I know the Chinese did too. He said, but I would welcome them back. I learned so much from those guys. So Zaidi Ali. The second story comes from the DR Congo. And this is the one that was portrayed on uh, uh, C CBS website as um, half the arable land in the Congo. So this, again, was a real project. It's a Chinese telecommunications company. You may know them, Zhongxing Telecommunications, ZTE. Um, they had a big tele telecommunications construction project in the Congo. And, uh, but their headquarters back in Shenzhen, they decided to diversify into biofuels. And so they were running, um, <coughs> sorry, sorry, ZTE decided to diversify into biofuels. And so they had this uh, operation already in the Congo. And they asked uh, the Congo, the head of their telecommunications <laughs> firm, can you find us some land? And so 
they did, the Congolese government was very excited about this. ZTE said, we want to do a really big project. And there were various things that came out in the media, 3 million hectares, 1 million hectares, 300,000 hectares. The actual MOU that they signed was 100,000 hectares. So it was, it was big, it wasn't 3 million, but it was still quite large. So their intentions were very real. Um, and so uh, Wang Kuwen, who was the guy in charge of this, I interviewed him later on to get the story from him, and he said, of course, he didn't know anything about biofuels, so he hired a group of uh, people to come in from Mal Malaysia. And they came and they got on a plane and they flew above the Congo. And they, from high above, they could say, yes, it looks very suitable. And then they <coughs> landed the plane, they took soil samples, and they said, you can really grow oil palm here. This will be a great project. They just said, there's just one problem. There aren't any roads <laughs> at all. <laughs> no roads at all. You're going to have to bring everything up this river. And so Wang Kowin said, all right, let me get a team of people from China who know something about rivers. And so they, they came in. Uh, the team, they got a boat, and they decided to travel up the river to the area where they thought they might grow this oil palm. And the first day, they ran into a sandbar in the boat stop. The second day, the boat broke down. The third day, they ran into two sandbars. And they were slowly, slowly going up the river. And the, finally, the team turned to Wonka and they said, it's going to take 100 years to develop this river for commercial transport. And you're never going to be able to bring in all of your equipment. You have to build a factory up there and then bring everything down again. They said, forget it. And so they did. They ended up with 200 hectares of a pilot project to see if the oil palm would grow. The third uh, example comes, um, this actually is a picture I downloaded from Facebook. <laughs> so this is uh, Kambu Kalani Firi. He's become a good friend. He is a Zambian who went to China to study engineering. And uh, while he was studying engineering, he fell in love. He fell in love. And so he decided he wasn't ready to go back to Zambia yet. And he got a job with um, a uh, renewable energy company. And that renewable energy company, uh, Wuhan Kaidi, they were interested in going global and moving outside of Wuhan. And so they asked him to scout around where they could get some land and do some biofuels. So they thought he would go off to Indonesia. And he said to them, well, what about Zambia? <laughs> so he could get a trip home, but that's also, he, he thought maybe he could um, find some land for them. So he came to Zambia. And uh, they actually had very big ambitions again. They wanted to do something very large. At the end of the day, they were able to get 87,000 hectares. They got agreements from all the local chiefs. It took years to do this. Um, and then it had to be approved by the president of Zambia. To make a long story short, the president of Zambia wasn't willing to approve this. He was also named Michael Sata. He was someone who was very concerned about the Chinese presence in Zambia, and uh, it was an election year. So that project ended up not working. So Kumbu Kalani then went off and did um, a PhD in Britain. So that's, he just finished that right now with Flying Colors, another big project that didn't go anywhere. So again, this is one that I think was, um, I don't remember the exact size of it, but was well over 100,000 hectares. And, uh, millions, I think, in fact. Two, two million, that was what it was in the media reports. So what are the Chinese actually doing in Africa? There are a lot of Chinese there. Certainly they're there doing all sorts of things. Uh, but here, the, the biggest thing that you'll see across most countries is still aid projects. So these are um, a, an example of one of the aid projects, uh, the sign from outside. Uh, there are 25 of these in 25 countries, and they're very small scale. They're trying to work with African governments to build their capacity to grow food. Um, and this is, it's an interesting model because each one of these projects is being done by a Chinese company or a research institute, but most of them are companies. And they're supposed to use this as a platform for business. And so you might think of this as, it, it's a sort of public-private partnership that the Chinese are doing. It's an experiment. And it's, it's similar in some ways to what we are doing. Um, this is a, a U.S. program, it's a, well, it's a G8 program. And it's the New Alliance for Food Security and Nutrition, and it's focused on Africa. And in a similar kind of way, we are uh, using Cargill and other uh, companies, Monsanto, these are big corporations. They're jumping onto this food security program that the U.S. is very involved in. We are taking a leadership position in this, and it's really this public-private partnership to foster food security. So it's very similar in some ways to what the Chinese are doing. Um, they are also trying to 
get sales of their equipment. This is from Zimbabwe, where the Agrotechnology Demonstration Center, the main thing they do there is they showcase Chinese agricultural equipment. Um, uh, production, agricultural production in Zimbabwe is largely mechanized, and so there is a market for this. And in some ways, this is very much like what we're doing. This is John Deere, an American uh, company. Now, I'll tell you a little story about this one. This Actually, this John Deere was on a Chinese farm that I visited in Zambia. And uh, this tractor was imported from Brazil. So it's an American company being produced in Brazil and being sold in Africa. And the Chinese um, entrepreneur who bought this said to me, these are much better quality than what we have in China so far. So there are some areas where we can cooperate instead of just competing. Another thing they're doing is uh, science. So here's Yuan Longping High Tech. They have uh, agribusiness, agrotechnology. They want to sell these uh, high yielding seeds, hybrid seeds, and other uh, areas. You probably have heard now that a Chinese company have bought, has bought Syngenta. And everyone thinks this is only about China's food security at home. But it's really about agribusiness. They want to be involved in these, uh, in these leading sectors uh, around the world and buying um, uh, the world's leading companies for this makes a lot of business sense. So they're also active in, in Africa and other parts of the third world. I interviewed uh, Yuan Lomping in, um, in Changsha to ask him about his company's investments in Africa. And I wanted to find out, he wasn't that interested in talking to me about Africa. He was like, okay, yeah, we have these few little things here and there, small projects. The, the one that I showed you where I did my PhD research, that's one of their projects now. It's about 400 hectares, maybe a little larger. But what he really wanted to talk to me about was America. He said, you know, in Texas, they're buying our hybrid rice. He said, we're getting all these royalties from America. And he, he really wanted to say, like, that's what we're really interested in. Africa is just kind of like it's a sideline, not that big. So this is a, these two pictures I didn't take, but these are from uh, construction projects that uh, CIDIC, which is a big construction company in China, they are doing, along with several other firms, these big state farms in Angola. So the Angolan government is building state farms for their own food security. Chinese companies are helping them do this for a profit. Again, they're doing this as construction projects. So this is a picture from the, uh, one of the markets in Lusaka. You can see these Chinese guys up here. They're actually buying some, uh, some spring onions from a Chinese farmer. So it's an example of these little Chinese farms that are scattered all around the continent. Everywhere where you have Chinese living, which is just about everywhere now, you'll have Chinese restaurants, you have the need for Chinese vegetables, and there's a market. But as you can see, most of this market is not Chinese. It, it's African, and uh, there's just we're a few people. There's this group here, and there was another woman who was selling eggs just outside there, and somebody else was selling mushrooms. So it's very, very few. But you do find those, and that's also the case in, uh, all around the continent. And finally, this is an example of a, um, one of those 20,000 hectare projects that I visited in Zambia. This is a woman I interviewed there. And she's a subcontract farmer. So she is growing rice on this project here. Uh, she has one big plot. I think it's about um, 20 hectares. And uh, she works for this Chinese company as a subcontractor. Right now, there are other Chinese um, subcontractors. There are about 100 or 200, maybe 180 that are there, and then uh, they're training Mozambicans to uh, also expand this area. So contract farming is a big area of interest. Some of that is in food, but this is for Mozambique, not for China. As uh, people said to me when I asked them, well, you want to export this to China? They said, you know, right now Africa is importing 10 million tons of rice annually. And if we wanted to import rice, and if, when we do want to import rice in China, we're going to go to the same places that they're importing it from. We're going to go to Vietnam and India and uh, Bangladesh or wherever it is, Pakistan, all of these areas where, um, or even the United States, because we export rice. And we're probably not going to be going to Mozambique for this. So the last thing we did was we looked at trade data. So we dug into the, the minute parts of the trade data and com trade to try to find out, well, are they still secretly bringing in food from Africa? And what we found out is overwhelmingly who's going to be feeding China is uh, the Americas. You know, it's, it's corn from the United States, it's soybeans from Brazil and from Argentina. Um, and this is, this is Brazil here. So that is where the food is coming from right now. It's coming from the Americas, and it doesn't look as though it's going to be coming from Africa, at least not anytime soon. Now, at the end of the book, though, I do hold out some hope that um, commercial farming will take hold in Africa. I think that it's something they need to do. It's something there are some possibilities uh, for. 
And it's interesting that when you go back enough, far enough in the trade data, you see things like Zimbabwe in the 1980s and even in the 1990s was a big grain exporter. They exported uh, wheat and maize to Asia, to Indonesia, uh, to the Philippines, to Japan, and even to China. So the possibilities are there. It's not happening now. Perhaps one day in the future, Africa will be able to feed itself and then maybe feed China. Thank you. Thank you.